Welcome to Miami for the first of its kind meeting, and welcome to those of you joining us online. For those of you who are here in the audience, I ask you to now look at your phones. Let's start again. <laughs> See, I'm so used to hearing my own self speak that I figured that everyone else could hear me. So again, welcome to Miami. To all of you who are here in our studio audience and those of you online, uh, welcome to the forum that we're having today on U.S. security. Um, for those of you who are here, please look at your phones and silence them. Thank you. Um, I want to note the importance of having the opportunity to, to discuss election security and to hear directly from state and local election officials. I want to talk about a little bit um, and thank the Congress for the $380 million that they've appropriated for the uh, purpose of increasing security and other factors, particularly um, the Rules Committee in the Senate and the um, House Administration Committee, the, the two committees of jurisdiction for the, um, committee on how, for, for the Election Assistance Commission. Today is an opportunity for state and local election officials to offer their concerns and statements on election security. And I want to welcome you all here again today. And then, uh, Commissioner McCormick, do you have a few words? Thank you, Commissioner Hicks. I'm Christy McCormick. I'm vice chair of the EAC. Uh, I'd like to ditto uh, chair, Chairman Hicks and welcome you all to our EAC Forum on Election Security and to those online uh, watching this afternoon. Events like this are very important to us uh, as EAC commissioners and our staff as well because it helps us understand the issues facing election officials better and it gives us information and perspectives on how we can serve state and local election officials as they run our, count our country's elections. I would be remiss if I also did not acknowledge uh, the Trump administration and uh, the, those in Congress, especially those whose leadership helped to secure the $380 million in HAVA funds for the states to improve the administration of elections prior to the 2018 election this year. Uh, we are very thankful for Brian Newby, our executive director, and for Dr. Mark Abbott, our EAC grants director, uh, and our other staff members who have surpassed any other effort that I know of of this type in getting these funds out to the states in record-breaking time, uh, just weeks, which for the federal government is pretty amazing. Um, I was able to call a number of the state officials uh, to inform them of the amount of the appropriation that their states would be receiving and uh, received the whole gamut of reactions to that news. Uh, but I want to report that we are in really good hands with those who are responsible for conducting American elections. Across the board, we have serious, dedicated public servants who place as a top priority well-run, secure, and fair elections. The administration of elections has changed dramatically over the past 18 years uh, and are continuing to change, and we are in a completely different environment even in this past two years. Election insecurity is now at the forefront of the minds of all election officials across the country, and I am looking forward to hearing from just a few of them uh, and hearing their perspectives on the issue. The EAC's mission is to serve our election officials, so I hope that the statements that they will give us today help us serve the election officials even better. I'm going to turn this over to our executive director, Brian Newby, at this point, but I also want to urge those election officials who are not able to be here today to let us know what your concerns are and what the EAC can do to help. Um, please reach out to me directly or to one of our staff online or on the phone, and we will do whatever we can to assist you in this important effort. So thank you again for being here, and uh, I will introduce Brian Newby, the Executive Director of the Election Assistance Commission. Brian. Thank you, Commissioners. When we first came up with the idea of this forum, the thought process was that there are many people who have weighed in on the idea of election security, and we wanted to have an opportunity for election officials expressly to speak about their thoughts about election security. And so this was for election officials, by election officials. That was really the, the concept behind the meeting. 
We have created a number of resources on our website, eac.gov, for security best practices. We will conduct IT training for election administrators. We've also created a video that election administrators can show to civic groups, rotary clubs, that kind of thing, to explain how election security works before they get into the specifics of their jurisdiction. I think we were all disappointed when we had the government shutdown leading to our uh, cancellation or at least postponement of the earlier meetings in January. But that uh, process actually manifested itself into the Omnibus Appropriations Act in March, which then included the $380 million in grants uh, or HAVA funds for uh, many things, including election security. And then it gave us the opportunity now to be able to speak to that as part of this forum. So that's what we're going to do now in, in a moment. I'll hand it over to Mark Abbott, who has done a terrific job getting ready, getting the money prepared to be distributed to the states. I want to show you just one quick map you see. Uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of how the funds are spread out. The more green you see, the more green the states get, basically. And uh, that's about the level of detail I'm prepared to explain here right now. So I'm going to now hand it over to Mark, who will get into all the details of the process. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chairman Hicks, uh, Vice Chairman McCormick. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and uh, our election officials across the country today about these grants. Uh, the EAC team has done uh, just a ton of work in the last three weeks to get to where we are today. And I'm happy to give a very brief overview of the process for, for, for getting the money, for putting together some plans on how you're going to use the money and talk some, in spe some specifics about the way states might use those funds. So just a quick, and I also want to do a quick history, right? So we, we want to talk a, just a little bit about what kind of money we have at the EAC over time. It's actually been eight years since we've had money um, appropriated by Congress, and the last money that we received was Section 251 requirements payments to meet the actual requirements of Title III. So it was a very specific purpose on those grants. Uh, Section 102 was to replace uh, a type of equipment that Congress decided we should no longer use. So it was a mandate and there was money sent for, um, appropriated for that purpose a long time ago, back in 2003. And then Section 101 money, also in 2003, was to improve the administration of elections and it listed some things you could do with the money, but it was the most flexible type of money available to the states at the time. Uh, and really put the onus on them because and, and, they knew best what, what they needed in their state and allowed them to administer these funds um, to improve their election, federal election processes. So when it became apparent that we we're going to get additional money for security and improvements to elections, we thought 101 was the place that, that money might go. Congress agreed uh, with the staff and were able to make the appropriation of $380 million signed on March 22nd. Uh, under Section 101 of HAVA. Um, th this money needs to be expended by um, 2023, so it's not here forever. Um, we have five years to, to, to draw down and use the money. Uh, the award packets were issued on April 17th, which I thought was a, a good day since mostly Uncle Sam was taking money from us, but we were able to turn around and give a fair amount back um, to the states for elections. The award packets has, has three parts to it. It has the Notice of Grant Award, which is a legal document that allows states to access the money and, and gives them the requirements they have to follow to, to, if they're going to take the money. And then some instructions on how to draw the money down from their accounts at the Treasury, U.S. Treasury. And then, somewhat uniquely, we have this 90-day deadline in there. And that 90 days is how long states have to put a plan together for how they want to spend that money. These plans are, are one to three pages in length. Um, we will post them on our website. We're going to offer some technical assistance and support as states begin putting these together. But they don't have to put the plan together to access their funds. The funds are available as of today. So you can go to our website. You can pull down a, a simple template to request your funds, and you can have the money in three to five days in your account at your state um, to spend on immediate needs that you know that you may or have in the run-up to the 2018 election. So even as you're spending money on, on things that are really important, you also have the 90 days to put together your plan. 
Uh, the Congress was pretty specific when they said, listen, this is what we want the money to go for. It's to improve the administration of your of federal elections, including to enhance technology and make election security improvements. So election security is on everyone's mind. It's why we're here today. Uh, it's, what, it, it's been a tremendous amount of press on this topic. And uh, I'm happy to say that the 101 funds are probably the best vehicle we have uh, at, at the Election Assistance Commission to allow states the flexibility and speed to put in place what they need. So you can improve administration generally, and it's a very broad category, and on the website you'll find all kinds of examples of how states have done that in the past and what the EAC has said is allowable there. You can do education, training, equipment, voting systems and technology, as well as methods for casting and counting votes. Uh, you can work on accessibility, quality of, as for um, language accessibility, as well as handicap accessibility, um, the quality and quantity of your polling places. There's a broad, broad gamut of stuff here. But if you look closely at what HAVA authorizes, it, you can see that some of the critical parts of what we need to do in, in positioning for a more secure vote and feeling like we have a more secure vote is around communication, training, convening, the kind of things that traditionally we just don't have funds to do at the state level, this money can be used for that. And we're getting lots of good ideas from states now on how they plan to use those funds. We will post those ideas on the website and share them as broadly as we can as, as, as innovative ideas roll in from our partners in the states. So that's a very brief overview of the funds. Uh, I think the highlights are it's flexible money because we know states know how to, what they need. Uh, and they have 90 days to talk to their stakeholders and figure out exactly how they want to deploy these resources out over a five-year period of time. Uh, and the money's available now because we know the issues are now. So that, that's it on my part. And I, I, I can answer questions. And I'll be available afterward. One other thing, I also have with me Mike Kenefek. <coughs> He's a contractor for the Election Assistance Commission. He's been contracting with us for, for since 2010. He knows HAVA very, very well and HAVA <coughs> funds well. He helps with our audit resolutions. Uh, he's available today and, and, through, the, and through Friday um, to answer questions and help states get ready to um, put their uh, uh, request the funds and begin spending them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abbott and uh, Executive Director Newby for your uh, comments here today. I have a few questions, um, most of which I do know the answers to but um, it's more of uh, making sure that those folks who are out there in the um, audience and online who have these same questions um, get those answers. Um, these are some of the things that I've been hearing for the last um, 40 days or so since the uh, president signed this on March 23rd. Um, when is the money available? So the money is available as of yesterday. Uh, so states simply have to follow a five-step um, process to access the funds, and we can have them in the state election funds. The full amount available to your state or a portion of the amount available, it's the state's discretion how much they want to pull down and what time they want to pull it down uh, from the U.S. Treasury, as long as they do it um, within five years. And so the 90-day um, the um, period for states to issue their two to three page narrative. When does that clock start? So that started yesterday. So okay. I think if I did that right, it's July 15th or 16th that we're looking to have those back um, from the states. And since this is 101 funds, um, Congress has said that um, they would like for states to use this money to purchase new voting equipment. Uh, they were explicit on what kind of equipment they would like, uh, but that still means that it has to adhere to the law in assuring that those who have disabilities can vote independently and privately. Um, but that being said, um, there are very few restrictions on what this money can be used for, correct? That's correct. So there is, of course, Congress can choose to say, we want you to do this and pass a law very specifically, like replacing punch card voting systems. They didn't do that in this case. They said, we want you to work on security. We want you to look at these machines that, that perhaps don't have the, the, the audit trail that, that, might be, that people are looking for. But the decision as to what you buy and when you buy it is, is yours at the state level. Uh, so uh, that's, that's how they, it was decided. Director Newby. Well, if I could just add, I think that the, I mean, our view is, well, two, two aspects. I think, for one, 
we were going to judge our success in this in terms of EAC and how fast we get the funds out and then how efficiently we can administer the program. And I think Mark's done a great job with that aspect. The, the way the funds can be utilized uh, sync with Section 101 of HAVA, and that can include in improving the administration of elections, which includes election security. And so that's the, the key thing we want to say is that this can, there are very few restrictions on the way these funds can be used, and Mark is an expert in knowing what those restrictions are. Right. And so I've already um, received a few comments, um, but the, the question from your first slide um, being that it looked like the states of Montana and North Dakota were white uh, in there, and basically it was the same as the color of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, meaning that the Atlantic <laughs> and Pacific are going to get zero. But each state will receive at least how much money? Uh, Three million dollars. Correct. That's set by a formula uh, in HAVA that was modified by in the appropriation uh, this year um, to make sure that the small states received uh, enough funds to, um, to do something with. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner McCormick? Yeah, and I just want to clarify the territories are not getting $3 million, right? They're just getting 600000 So the 50 states, uh, which uh, get the $3 million is the minimum for a small state minimum, and then if you're a U.S. territory, um, uh, not Puerto Rico, the other territories, you get $600,000 in federal funds. But the territories don't have a match requirement, is that, that correct? That is correct. So there's a 5% match, and could you just give us the sort of outline of that 5% match? Right. So uh, in, for the, this was the other adjustment. To, the funds were adjusted in two ways by the, in the appropriation. They were um, made one-year money, which means you have five years to spend this money rather than being available forever or in perpetuity like the older HAVA funds were. And there's a f match on this, and that's 5% of the federal share. So on the chart that we posted on the website, you can see what your match obligation is. But you do not need that match obligation up front. You need to produce that match over a period of two years. So, and we'll look for that uh, documentation on your federal financial report that the states submit to us annually. The match can be cash or in kind. In this case, an in kind contribution would be something else that you're purchasing or doing with non federal money that's, the sa that's aligned with what you're doing in your grant that can count as your match. So, the match can cascade down to the local level. So we know we have a, every locality is working on security as well. They may well easily have the 5% they would need if the state chooses to put some of the money that they've received down to the local level to be spent at that there. And if they've already spent the money in this fiscal year, can they use that as a match prior to this bill being signed? So the, the, there is a question of when the, the grant actually starts on the, when the president signed the bill. Uh, the omnibus uh, appropriation goes back to the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, so states should contact my office if they want to have uh, costs that were incurred after October 1st, 2017, included as match or as, as part of the federal um, share. Uh, we can we will work through those and, and adjust their awards as as needed. Make sure they'll pass audits, right? That's correct. Yeah. So I didn't mention the audit, uh, it, you know, obligations here. It's been a long time since we've had new money, but there are serious audit obligations the states will face in accepting these funds. Uh, our office, uh, the grants office, is our job is to minimize those risks and provide the right kind of support and technical assistance both before and after the audit to make sure that, you know, states can be focused on the, using the money uh, for the things that they need to get done, not worrying necessarily about the, the audit situation for them. So we'll make sure they're well educated and have the material they need to be successful. And that the narrative really goes to that audit situation, right? That's documentation so that uh, with, they have some sort of documentation to show when they get audited that they're appropriately using the money. That's right. We need an audit standard. Uh, so the standard is found in the OMB circulars. It tells you kind of w the kinds of things you can do and not do with federal money, what kind of record keeping you need to keep, for example. The, nar the three-page narrative and the corresponding budget is, allows us a, a guide, a guide for, to audit against. So if you do these activities 
in your, if you say you're going to do these activities in your plan and your budget reflects that and then you do entirely different activities uh, that's not, and your budget reflects something is not reflected in the activities, that will be questioned in an audit. So those, those standards are, you're setting your standards for how you want to spend the money and then we, the auditors will audit against what you've said you want to do. Can they update state. or amend those narrative so, statements? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. as needed. Uh, okay. And I fully anticipate doing w rounds of revisions. I, I think after you hold an election, you see things you didn't see before and you may want to deploy federal, these federal resources against those needs. Um, that should, is absolutely allowable and encouraged. Now, I know Congress wanted this money specifically to be used as soon as possible, and that's why they made, made it pretty much no strings attached and, and wanted to be flexible and get this money out. If the states draw down the money within the five years uh, and hopefully spend it, but if they don't spend it, can they hold on to that money, or do they have to actually spend it within the five years? So we, we've set a five-year project period for this fund, so the EAC's grants office expectation is that you're going to use the money over a five-year period. If you need the money over a longer period of time, then we can look at doing an extension for, for, for that program period. I, I, I think that um, unlike the early money, which some states uh, used as a rainy day fund or for emergencies or contingencies that they weren't aware of yet, which was you know, a very fine use of the money and allowable under the law, we don't have that same flexibility this year. If, if Congress wanted to give us that flexibility, they could have in the appropriation. They did not. So we're putting everyone on this five-year clock, and uh, we want to, you know, help them get through this tranche of money in five years. Yeah, thank you for that, because I did have some questions when I called the states, uh, kind of in that vein, you know, how long they had to spend the money, whether they could hold it for a rainy day fund, things like that. So I appreciate that clarity. and. Uh, would urge the states to work with Mark and work with our staff uh, to make sure that the way the money's going to be spent will be appropriate and that they'll be able to pass the audits, the required audits uh, that the federal government uh, requires. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Thank you. I'm good. Um, I want to thank you both, but um, before we leave, before um, you um, leave the panel, um, the EAC will be holding several conference calls and webinars um, over the next few months for states to um, ask questions and, and go forward with this as well, correct? That, that's correct. So that'll be on the website, and we, we'll post to those, and we'll do as many as we can. Um, and so that, uh, and, and as we learn new things from our partners in the states, we will make sure that that gets shared. And if I could, one thing we'd like to do going forward as this program starts to get implemented is uh, highlight the successes that states and localities have by using these grants and create a series for our clearinghouse that explains and, and promotes the uses that some use or have for this money. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So now we're going to uh, have the local uh, election officials come up to the table, and after that, we're going to have the state election officials um, do their uh, panel. The third panel will be an open mic, and that open mic is for election officials only. So um, we're looking to hear from election officials who are here today um, on the process that they're doing on, in terms of security. Um, and as these folks get uh, situated, I um, want to make you aware of a clock that we have up here, uh, because myself included, I like to talk on and on and on and on, but we don't want to go all night. So the clock is going to be set for each of you for five minutes. Uh, the green light is your time. Yeah, David, I'm looking at you. So <laughs> yeah, the green light will be uh, for four minutes and 30 seconds, and then it will blink yellow for 30 seconds. And then the red will be a please stop, please wrap up. Um, and I believe it actually will make a noise. So, um, <laughs> so that being said, I want to introduce our panel here today. Starting on my left, Lance Goth is the Executive Director, Board of Elections Commissioner for Chicago, Illinois. Lance has been the Executive Director uh, managing voter registration, election administration for 1.5 million voters for three decades. During his tenure, the agency has been a pioneer on several fronts, including the recruitment and training of 2,000 high school poll workers in every citywide election. 
being the first major jurisdiction to utilize electronic poll books in every precinct and lobbying successfully for online voter registration. Election day registration and online ballot access, access for military and overseas. Lance, thank you for being here today. I look forward to hearing your feedback. Um, I can introduce all of you or just, I'll, let me just go down the line. Ricky Hatch, who is the clerk for Weber County, Utah. Ricky was elected clerk auditor for Weber County, uh, Utah in 2010. Ricky was honored by his fellow uh, county auditors as Utah's 2013 Auditor of the Year and 2015 Clerk of the Year. Ricky has previously served as Information System Auditor and Consultant for Price Waterhouse, a Business Analyst and Project Manager for Parametric Technology Corporation, and as a Financial Analyst for Jetway. Thank you, Ricky, for being here today as well. Nora Prates, Director of Elections for Cook County Clerk Office, Chicago, Illinois, which is different than the Board of Elections for, for Chicago. Uh, Nora serves as Director of Elections in Cook County, uh, one of the largest jurisdictions in the country. Each year, his team services 1.5 million voters, facilitates democracy for thousands of candidates, and trains and supports thousands of volunteers to administer democracy. He started as a temporary worker hired to help during uh, data entry to the 2000 presidential election. He worked his way through the ranks during nearly every election job in the department, learning the pain points and opportunities while going to law school at night. Hmm. Noah became deputy director of elections in 2007 and was appointed director in 2013. He's a board member of the uh, in IGO and the National Association of Government Afo Officials, along with Ricky as well. Uh, he also serves uh, as the election center and um, Illinois Association of County Clerks and Recorders. His previous, he has presented on stability, election day uh, management, online registration, voter registration modernization, and other election related issues. Um, and today he will deliver his marks on election security. Last but not least, David Stafford is the uh, supervisor of election for, I always pronounce it wrong, so I'm gonna let you do it. Um, it's Gambia County, Florida, which is up in the panhandle. Uh, David was elected uh, in 2004. In addition to his work in Florida, he also serves in leadership positions to um, guide election policy at a national level, including co-chair for CSG Overseas Voter Initiative Policy Working Group, and is a board member of the National Advisory Board, um, Election Systems and Software, and, and as a member of the Technology and Elections Working Group for the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. He previously served in the Northwest Florida Director of U.S. Senator Connie Mack, uh, Chief of Staff for U.S. Congressman Joe Scarborough, Producer for MSNBC Cable News Network, and Director for Federal Affairs at Grocery Manufacturers of America. I want to thank you all for being here today, and um, Lance, we can start with you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, to both commissioners, it's a pleasure to see you again. Those of us with decades of experience in the election administration have weathered many changes. New, introducing of new voting equipment under HAVA, introducing of election early voting, expanding the use of vote by mail, in some jurisdictions, electronic poll books, and in jurisdictions like mine, online registration, election day registration, and Sioux automatic registration. Clearly, the newest cha challenges need to be maintain the faith in the security of our election franchise. One of the first episodes that brought about this change was the Russians hacking into my home state, the state of Illinois State Board of Elections voter registration database. To me, this was just as significant as the problems we experienced with punch card voting. After hacking in the summer of 26 affected no in individual voter registration records. I'd like to repeat that hacking had no effect on no individual's voting records. 
It was it, it had no effect on balloting systems. The Illinois registration system is merely a gathering uh, reflection of 109 counties that feed their data into it. So none of those were hacked at the time. Which brought a problem that we had. The Russians, with the Russians, managed to do something that really caused a major problem. They undermined the faith in our franchise. Similarly, similarly in Chicago, we had an ex exposed in the summer of 2017. I received a call on Saturday. In fact, the person that called me is sitting down from me, Noah Prates, called me up and said, Lance, looks like something happened. Your voter data is out there and because he got a call from the FBI. We found out that it was from a vendor that was working on electronic poll books. After we found that out, we were able to shut that down. We had uh, the information uh, surface. We went through the dark web, found out none of this data got out. In fact, the only person that uh, saw this data was a security cop that gave the alarm and told us what was going on. As soon as we found that out, we then uh, contacted the media. I contacted election uh, officials around the United States explaining what happened. I contacted law enforcement. We went right down. We had a press conference that same next day, spoke to the media, explained to what happened, that no data got out. But because of that, has left us wide open. What we need to do is concentrate more on who has our data. And this was a vendor that has been in the election field for many years. And after that has happened, we were, had to rethink what we need to do about our data. Um, our data needs to be controlled that in case somebody could hack into it, it can't do any good. We want to reduce the amount of data that's out there on the web. Uh, I know we have to have person's name and address, but we don't have to have their full birth of dates. We don't have to have their last four digits of Social Security. So what we're doing is we're going to scale back on any data that's going out. So in case if somebody ever did get into the system, which I'm hoping it'll never happen again, but who knows. With uh, what's going on right now, we had a word that uh, we see that people are hacking into uh, people's home computers now. Uh, the routers are being hacked into. This is something that we need to really take a look at. So I just want to uh, say that we're going to reduce the number of, of stuff that's out there. We're going over security procedures with all of our vendors, our websites managers, our webs, web farms, even our printers that print out our verification of registration cards. All that data is going to be reduced to bare bones hoping that if we do get hacked again, which with the way things are going, who knows what will happen, that we'll be prepared and that nothing will get out. So thank you for letting me know and let me speak. We're looking at uh, least risk management. We're looking at the least problems with getting that information out there. I tell you. So I did notice that, um, thank you for your testimony. Um, and I do have a few questions, but I think that it probably will be best if we let everyone speak and then do uh, a round of questions that way. Very um, good. The, the timer itself is gonna be, it blinks at two minutes, and then one minute it starts doing the yellow blink beep. So, so Ricky, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks for having us here and having this event. Uh, the biggest cybersecurity hurdle that we face as election officials isn't a piece of technology. Uh, it isn't even a thing that we can purchase and install. It's building and maintaining public trust. In life, most stuff flows downhill. Water, mud, rocks. And when things go bad in an organization, other stuff flows downhill. And it gets worse the farther down it goes, right? We've all seen it. But when it comes to trust in government, gravity changes, gravity changes course. Trust flows uphill. Let me explain. There are a couple polls, one from Gallup and one from YouGov, that shows that 71% of Americans trust their local government to handle problems. 
while only 62% of them trust their state government. And the number drops to a dismal 31% for the federal government. Trust starts locally and flows up the mountain. It's the same with public trust in elections. The closer the election is to home, the more likely we are to trust it. Why? Because there's a name and a face. Because I, as a voter, can observe the process, ask questions, and actually talk to a human being in my own county, not someone further up the mountain at the state capitol or back in Washington, D.C. A voter's trust in the nation's elections process is driven by the voter's experience with their local, local election office. Whether it's registering to vote, receiving a ballot in the mail, using voting equipment at a polling place, or checking out election results on the web, the voters' interaction is almost always with their local election official. Local election officials are the face and the voice of our nation's elections infrastructure, and they are what drive the fundamental level of trust in every single election. This is how it should be, but it does present a challenge. The very level of government that the voters trust the most to secure their elections is also the level that has the fewest resources to do that and has the least amount of control over how these new federal funds will be spent. In fact, as I've studied federal legislation and participated in cybersecurities over the past couple of years, it feels to me that when state and federal level folks use the phrase state and local election officials, they often mean state election officials. I don't think this is intentional. I think it's just a mindset that needs to be examined. Now, I realize that I sound like I'm griping, like I'm saying that local election officials like Rodney Dangerfield get no respect, right? And I don't mean to, but we need to recognize that local officials need to be the face of elections to the country because they're the ones whom the people trust and they need the money and the training to do it right. There are almost 9,000 dedicated local election officials throughout the country and the vast majority of them are small, underfunded, and not staffed with cybersecurity experts. Over two thirds of them have fewer than 20,000 voters. Only 300 of them, or about 3%, have joined the Election Infrastructure ISAC, or Information Sharing and Analysis Center. I'll bet about three fourths of them haven't even heard about the EI ISAC yet. Now, our challenge as federal, state, and local election officials is to figure out how to support the local officials with the training, technology, and funding so they can ensure their own house is in order and then confidently educate the voters about the security of their elections. And one way to do this is to ensure that when these federal HAVA funds start flowing downhill that they don't all stop at the state level. Now, of course, most states are the keepers of the voter registration databases, which are critical to the integrity of the election. They absolutely need funding to ensure that these voter rolls are secure, but the funds must not get stuck there. They are needed at all levels, especially at the level that voters interact with the most. These funds, when accompanied with training and expertise from our state and federal partners, they will help local election officials properly implement cybersecurity tools and educate the public to ensure that public trust in the elections process stays strong. Now, fortunately, the EAC and DHS have already been working with state and local election officials, and organizations like IGO are pitching in as well. In fact, IGO has a webinar tomorrow afternoon to show officials how to use some specific free private sector resources to help stop DDoS attacks. Now, we appreciate being involved from the beginning, and we commit to bringing our A game with us as we work together, federal, state, and local election officials to strengthen the public's trust in our nation's election infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, Noah? Power here. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, commissioners. Our elections were attacked. The national security community warns us to expect more sophisticated and evolving attacks. Make no mistake, Local election officials are on the front lines, 108 in Illinois and over 8,000 nationally. Most of us are county officers facing down powerful, shadowy adversaries like county sheriffs sent to repel an invading army. Now, many locals in the election community are pressing for resources, first for better technology and routine hand-counted audits to give confidence that digital results are accurate. And second, and more critically today, we're pressing for top-notch personnel with skills to navigate the cyber minefield. 
Our country's local election officials need direct human support as we work to defend ourselves against the onslaught of digital threats we've been warned about. Over the past 15 years, our office has tried to lead on technology and security using applied forensics and elections, creating widely circulated cybersecurity checklists in advance of the 2016 elections, publishing the first white paper written by election officials in the wake of the 2016 attacks. Additionally, we worked with the Center for Internet Security in the Defending Digital Democracy program at Harvard's Belfer Center to help adapt their digital security expertise to the unique context of elections. As co-chair of the Government Coordinating Council that Homeland Security created to help address this election security effort, I've worked intimately with federal, state, and local leaders in elections, technology, intelligence, and law enforcement. In all these efforts, it became crystal clear that local election officials need someone, some person, to take ownership of security in each election office. In our office, we worked with our colleagues and my good friend Lance at the Chicago Board of Elections to share the cost of hiring a digital security expert. I simply can't fathom how other election officials can meet a foreign threat without a similar support or a similar investment. And it's a hefty investment. But defense of digital systems is very difficult. Just ask Uber or Equifax, HBO or Sony, Boston or Baltimore, the EAC or OPM. Congress just released $380 million to combat the election cybersecurity threat, and that's a very important start. It may be necessary to invest that much annually. Meanwhile, Americans justly concerned about the cost need confidence this money will be well spent. In my mind, there are two priorities. First, a handful of states and counties still have paperless voting systems, and these should be replaced as soon as possible. But second, everywhere across the country, we must improve the defensive capacities of local election offices. Most are run by just a handful of incredibly dedicated and hardworking heroes. But just a handful of heroes making critical security decisions are outmatched against the threats we've been warned of. Therefore, I envision an army of digital defenders serving election offices around Illinois and the nation, starting now and working through the 2020 presidential election at least. These digital defenders need to accomplish three vital goals. First, they will improve defenses within election offices, following the specific recommendations of the Center for Internet Security or Defending Digital Democracy, bringing up the floor of the election security ecosystem. Appropriately supported, we can see massive movement very quickly. There's lots of low-hanging fruit. Second, the digital defenders will work with outside vendors who provide much of the election's infrastructure to eliminate or defend specific vulnerabilities. And they'll also work through the necessary work to secure the free support being offered by public and private organizations like Homeland Security or Google or Cloudflare or the Elections Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And third, they will build a culture of security that adapts to the evolving threats we face. This massive reinforcement effort can be accomplished and it can be done now. It will require the states to cut through the red tape that can delay action. This may mean relying on existing contracts or even emergency procurements, but states must do whatever they need to do to get an army of digital defenders on the ground this summer. After all, the danger is not hypothetical. We're bracing against the renewed attacks we've been told to expect. If we fail to get experts into local offices who will help the locals shore up our defenses, we'll regret it. Election officials deploy a variety of network-connected digital services, such as informational websites, poll books, voter registration systems, unofficial election results displays. Each of these are ripe targets for our adversaries. A successful attack against those services may not change a single vote, but could still damage public confidence. This is particularly true in a time of great suspicion, disappointing gracelessness, and highly partisan grandstanding. Losing candidates are already apt to call their defeats into doubt. A new digital breach, no matter how far removed from the vote counting system, could turn sore losers to cynicism, disbelief, even revolt. That's the reaction our enemies want. We can't eliminate every chance of breach, but we can make successful attacks rare. We secure ourselves best against the expected threat by investing in people first, digital defenders, 
who can guide a coherent, flexible strategy against slippery adversaries. Thank you. Last but not least, nice, but not least David. Uh, well, I feel like I should welcome you all to Florida, although um, I'm closer to Dallas, Nashville, uh, and Charlotte, North Carolina than I am to uh, Miami. But uh, welcome to Florida. Glad you're here. And, and you're, not, you're no strangers to the state. I appreciate your efforts over the years in supporting what we do down here. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on at the, with the Government Coordinating Council and the work with the um, Department of Homeland Security with our state and local partners, and then talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Florida. Um, the GCC, with the Government Coordinating Council, is making I, what I believe is great progress, although the public generally may not be hearing a lot about it. Uh, when, you, when you look at the date of uh, the announcement by Secretary Johnson uh, declaring elections as critical infrastructure, it was only nine months later that the GCC was formed, which in federal government terms is lightning speed, in my humble opinion. Uh, the Sector Coordinating Council was uh, formed uh, shortly thereafter, and then we immediately got to work. I, I happened to serve, along with uh, my two colleagues here to my right, uh, Noah and Ricky, on, on the Government Coordinating Council, and we, we began to, to get to work uh, very quickly. Um, there's a working group established we're on coming up with a communications protocol. Uh, very, very important, I believe, uh, in the work between the, the federal, state, and local partners uh, in uh, establishing some framework uh, for how inf uh, this type of information is shared both up the chain and down the chain. Um, in addition, there was a pilot uh, that was uh, established in testing basically the multi-state uh, ISAC for use for the elections infrastructure and there was a decision made and that, that pilot was successful so now we have established the EI ISAC and I uh, don't want to steal uh, Amy Cohen's thunder from uh, NASED but uh, as of information I received today, 47 states, two territories, 376 local election offices, and three associations are now members of the EII SAC. And I'm proud to say that Florida's 55 out of uh, Florida's 67 counties uh, are members. Um, so lo lots, of, lots of great work uh, going on there. And generally, I think that the, the uh, relationship between uh, Department of Homeland Security and state and local election officials imp has improved. There was great I don't want to call it suspicion, but great unease initially with the, the designation because I don't think either side knew exactly what it meant. Uh, as the time has, has, has gone on and the officials be, began to work together with each other, I think there was a le there's a level of trust that's building that continues to build. We're, we're not fully there yet, uh, but I think that uh, uh, the partnership is working well. Uh, the GCC also, I think, importantly uh, represented uh, had rep ample representation of local election officials uh, uh, kind of talking about what uh, Ricky talked about earlier when you hear state and local a lot of times it's just state uh, but there is a significant presence of local election officials who are on the front lines which I believe is very important uh, and again on that communications piece is something that sounds really easy uh, yeah of course we should be sharing this information but once you start scratching beneath the surface and how does that framework actually what does it look like what what is an incident that uh, meets the threshold of being able to be uh, that requiring to be shared and how does that mechanism actually work it's a little more complicated than that but uh, great progress is being made led led by uh, Ricky Ricky's one of the uh, chairs of that um, uh, working group uh, as well as the sector a specific plan, which which Noah is, is uh, uh, working on, uh, which is basically the framework of what exactly the elections infrastructure um, uh, sector is going to is going to do. Um, it's wonderful that that Congress appropriated uh, that money, and it's and it's even better that that money is going to be getting, getting out quickly. Um, Congress has also been involved in in proposing legislation, and just one word of caution there. Um, in, my, in my opinion, the, when you start getting too specific in statutory language, for instance, the audit provision that was in one of the, the, main, uh, the, the one main pieces of legislation that's being proposed, uh, would require, I did some little analysis, 22% uh, of my ballots uh, in the 2016 primary election uh, being uh, subject to audit. Uh, that is a pretty high standard. I don't know if that's a, is that the gold standard. I don't know, uh, but I would hate for that to be enshrined. That speci that level of spec specificity be enshrined in statutory language. 
Um, let me talk a little bit now about what uh, uh, we're doing here in, in the state of Florida. Uh, we, we understand the role that we play in national elections, obviously. Um, the uh, legislature um, satisfied the Secretary of State's budget request for $2 million for counties uh, to acquire network monitoring devices. Um, the uh, supervisors themselves, the supervisors of elections, have, have held two EAC-sponsored uh, IT training sessions. We, in, we devoted an entire day at our last conference uh, to cyber uh, with officials from DHS, FBI, FDLE, the National Guard, and others uh, there present. Um, so we also are taking advantage of a lot of the resources that are out there from the aforementioned um, CIS playbook. Uh, the Defending D Digital Democracy Playbook, uh, as well as other efforts like Cloudflare's Project Athenian and uh, Google's Project Shield. Uh, so we understand that we're on the front lines. Uh, we are working uh, very extremely hard uh, at uh, shoring ourselves up uh, and look forward to continuing the work with our uh, state and federal partners uh, to ensure that we're in the best position we can be uh, for the 2018 elections and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I have a few questions, um, but before I get into the questions, I wanted to say, you know, thank you all uh, for serving as local election officials. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had an um, honor to go to a dear friend of mine's memorial, uh, Wendy Noren, who was a monster in terms of her tenacity and spirit and if there were any awards given to local election officials, she would have won it multiple times. Uh, so I wanted to thank you all for, for being a part of that um, because I know that it's sometimes thankless and sometimes it doesn't pay well and so forth, but I know that I have confidence in the process because of the four of you being here and, and the work that you do. Um, so with that, I have just a few questions. Um, and you know, starting with Ricky, the uh, David had mentioned what's the gold standard in terms of audit numbers, and um, he mentioned 22 percent. Uh, what's a typical number that's used for for audits overall? Um, well, be before I became an election official, I uh, I was a financial auditor actually, and an information systems auditor. Uh, and the, the standards are a little bit different there. Generally, in the, in the world of financial auditing, if you have a sample size of 60, 60 items to select, that provides sufficient uh, coverage, uh, assuming it's a statistical sample. Uh, I don't pretend to say that that would be adequate in the elections world. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, in the state of Utah, we look at about 5% um, as I, the, the threshold that we look at uh, and pr conduct audits on, and those are um, statistically selected at the state level and then communicated down to the counties. Um, a couple of you mentioned uh, Belfer Center and uh, Google and Cloud Air and um, a couple of other things. I know that uh, Microsoft is now doing something in terms of the di defending digital dis defending digital something or other, but they're now getting in that space as well. Um, are there other companies that you know of or institutions um, that are doing things in this realm that could, could aid um, local jurisdictions? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I say that because I know that um, it's not you, um, Lance and, and Noah, you come from a large jurisdiction, uh, you know, 1.5 million voters, um, so forth, and most, most counties don't have that number of voters, but they also don't have that number of election officials. Um, so the EAC has put together a program um, where one of the former commissioners would go out and, and um, talk to election officials. Um, it's basically um, IT management for IT for, for election officials, giving them a basis of what they need to look out for moving forward with this. And some of this can be found on our website at eac.gov, but um, I'm hoping that we can continually build on that because, as you know, elections are going to continue to happen. Um, we have 2018 coming up. 2020 is right around the corner. This $380 million um, is a nice payment. Um, I don't know if Congress is going to come back and give more money, 
but um, elections continue to happen. So uh, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the other aspects that are out there, if any of you know, um, and, and what sort of role can poll workers play in terms of election security? Um, generally, uh, what I've found is that I, I've yet to find somebody that tells me no um, when I picked up the phone and asked them to help. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a for instance. We, we happen to have the University of West Florida in my county, uh, and they've got a s center for cybersecurity there that's recognized a regional center. Um, and it was just one of those things, hey, you know, this is now becoming a really important issue. So I just picked up the phone and called the, the, the uh, head uh, the director of that center, and that resulted in a um, pilot program that was done at, at the state level with a handful of, of uh, my colleagues and staff went through a training, so a really in-depth training session there um, to see if this is something that could be modeled uh, so, or modified uh, to work with uh, state officials, uh, uh, local officials around the state. Um, so th there's a lot of resources out there um, just going out and, and asking people because they're, one of the things that everybody is, I think, has pride uh, and understands the importance of elections in, in, in the United States. And so when you call and ask them, hey, I'd like your help, I'd like some advice, again, uh, my, my experience has been people are readily uh, willing uh, to help. Now, some people may want to get, uh, you know, you may have to pay for some of these services and, and, and whatnot, but. Um, generally, there's been a willingness out there uh, to everybody to pitch in and say, you know, yes, it's important that we secure our elections and, and let, let us let us help you. The Department of Homeland Security has a ton of resources that they've pledged and offered to to help. Now, some of those are gonna it's gonna take some time to get them deployed and out. So there will probably be a waiting list for some of the services that are more robust, but. Uh, they've given every indication that those services are available to uh, election jurisdictions, large and small, which is great. But what one of the problems is, let's take Illinois for example, we have 109 different election officials that run elections in Illinois. Some have about 20,000 registered voters, some have less. They run their uh, elections off of one uh, jurisdiction runs their election off of all states computers what we need to do is get the word out to everybody and you'll see that a lot of the associations like uh, election center and other uh, uh, organizations are going to see more and more people coming to them to get information and help and it's something that we need to get down to the smallest jurisdictions because those are the ones that are going to be attacked Yeah, I'll just echo that it's a, this is a weak link problem and they'll keep shaking uh, windows until one of them opens, right? And uh, it could be one of us up here or it could be the smallest county in, in the state. And the truth of the matter is none of the organizations right now have full blanket coverage or uh, information sharing to every local election official. Uh, I think we recognize that in the Government Coordinating Council, one of our, uh, we have three primary goals, one of which is to create um, a, a communication channel that gets to all 8,800. So we have two major problems. One is getting the information to the two people, but even with it, without extra dedicated resource committed to securing the office, there simply is not the capacity. I mean, I'm amazed every time I meet with my colleagues from around Illinois at how much knowledge they hold in their head. In a big office, we're able to segment, create different silos of expertise. We've got the ability or the capacity to pull on threads when we're interested in something like cybersecurity. Um, that flexibility just does not exist. I, I firmly believe this challenge is only answered with direct human resource um, placed in local election officials' offices, people who have the capacity to accept, accept the threat and then to work through all the free resources that are already there. Commissioner McCormick. Thank you to all of you for being here. And I want to echo Chairman Hicks on thanking you for your service uh, as a local election official. So I, this is a tough job and very complex, and you all have done an amazing job in your jurisdictions. 
And so I want to thank you again uh, for doing a thankless job. Um, I, I think there's a silver lining in what happened in 2016, and that is we're focusing now on these problems. I know that election officials have always focused on these uh, problems, and, and to some degree, uh, not so laserly focused on election security, but I think this has brought this to the forefront for us in the last couple of years. So if there's a good uh, consequence to what happened, that is one of them. Um, I think we need to understand our threat uh, before we can address it. And so I would like to ask, um, I guess, Lance, uh, and any of you can join on, but what could actually happen if someone gets into the system? Well, it depends on what kind of system you're talking about. Our voter registration system, uh, is, let's say if somebody got in and wanted to shut down our electronic poll books. Well, luckily we have a backup signature book that we have that will be able to get out to the precincts. You know, we go back to paper. If the electronic systems get hacked, we have to go back to a paper-based system, and we're able to do that, luckily. Um, what, I'm, what people are talking about is actually get in and hack the actual vote counting. And it's very hard to do, considering we have so many different pieces of equipment out there, and you'd have to attack every single one that's not tied up to the internet or not online, which I feel that the ballot counting is secure is the election database that's what's vulnerable. And that's the one where we need to have uh, plans that we have to shut down and go back to another way of doing it, and that's paper. And it's always been a backup. Like we're going back to uh, paper ballots right now. If you remember in the beginning years, what we did is we had paper ballots. They went, you know, the poll workers with the more and more units of government, the ballots got larger and larger, it was harder to count. That's when we went to having equipment count the ballots in the precinct. Now we're looking at going back to paper ballots. So it's something that we need to actually look at and figure the best way of uh, securing everything, not only our vote counting, but also our actual infrastructure on who's voting and how we vote. So we've heard that the systems aren't connected to the internet. They are not. And, you know, so we've got voter registration systems, and then we've got actual voting systems, then we've got tab tabulation systems, election yes. night reporting systems. Mm -hmm. Do we look at those all separately, or do we look at them as a whole? David, what's your thought on that? Do we look at it as one single system? I don't think we look at it. I mean, I think we, we talk about election systems, and I think it's important verbiage that we're talking about here. Voting systems and election systems are not the same thing. And I think too often when, when people talk about things happening to, to voting systems, what they really mean is election systems. Um, what, one of the challenges that, that, that overrides what, what we all do is the balance of accessibility and security. Yeah. Um, that's, I don't think that's ever, ever been in, in more focused than it is right now. Uh, for instance, it's easy for a private sector company to say, don't ever open an email from an, uh, with an attachment that you're not absolutely sure uh, what it is. Well, if you're, if you're in a public office and you're dealing with, with the, the public, sometimes they're going to send you an email, please see attachment, okay? So it's not, it's, it's not as easy for a, uh, a public agency uh, sometimes uh, to be able to, to have the same level of, uh, of standards, I guess, as you will, as you would in, in a private sector. Um, the, the other, I think, thing that we, the greater realization, I think Lance touched on this earlier, is that we've always been focused on security. And it, the main, main focus has been on your, what I would call your traditional election security, your polling place security, your ballot security, the security of your voting equipment. So now, physical security. Physical security, correct. Now, I think there, there was a, you know, some were, were more focused on it than others, but now, it, it, you know, there's a, real, a realization and I think a, a level of urgency uh, among local election officials across the country 
uh, that this is an area where we need to spend a lot. And, it, and it's, I don't think it's unique to elections. I think it, it's government-wide, and I think it's private sector-wide. Um, that this is an emerging threat and we, we, we need to do what we can uh, to meet that threat. So again, verbiage is really important uh, when we're talking about things like voting systems and election systems because, he, you know, let's be clear. Somebody somewhere in the state of Florida, in the state of Illinois, is going to go to their polling place on election day in 2016 and they're not going to be in the precinct register. They're going to go to, to a polling place in a primary election and their, their party affiliation is not going to be what they think it is or should be. That, how do I know that's going to happen? Because it happens in every election. And that, in and of itself, does not mean that that election has been hacked. So we, I think we all have a, a level of responsibility uh, to be very careful uh, in, the, in the words that we use and uh, the, what's attributed as a hacked election versus what are the normal ebbs and flows uh, uh, of an election cycle. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, but I mean, even the word hacking is, right. you know, prone to misuse. Um, what is a hack? Right. Is it an attempt at penetrating a system? Is it actually getting into the system? I mean, we, you know, we, we do have to be careful about our verbiage, and maybe we need to, uh, you know, train some officials on that. I mean, that does affect voter confidence as well. Sure. And, and again, I, I think just to reemphasize, there is a, there's a level of, uh, of awareness and focus on that cybersecurity uh, side that there wasn't, there hasn't been to that level previously. Um, Ricky, what, you're working on uh, the communication part with the uh, Government Coordinating Council, I understand. And what are some of the challenges in uh, communicating the risks uh, and threats right now? That's a great question. I hope we have several hours to discuss right, I, it. I understand. <laughs> I know. Um, the, the idea is you want to foster as much communication as possible, but you also have to respect the different positions and levels that are involved in that communication uh, and some of the complications that occur when you have completely different entities that uh, are sometimes forced together that may not even trust each other or may have doubts about the other's motives. Um, Generally, in the elections world, we get along so well at federal, state, and local levels. We, we work closely, but it's not always the case. Um, the first thing we have to figure out is uh, what, would, what generates the sharing of, in, uh, of information? What necessitates that? There's always just general information sharing, but then you have potential incidents. Um, if we shared every time somebody had a DDoS attack, uh, it would be, our inboxes would be over overflowing all the time because that happens all the time so that's not worth sharing but where's the line and with whom do you share it if if my county comes under attack should no one know that well it probably depends on the severity and, and the scope and possibly even the source uh, should my state elections director know that uh, probably how about if the state is hacked should should the local election officials be notified I use hacked sorry <laughs> if the state is uh, potentially pre uh, breached or penetrated, uh, those are some of the challenges that we figure out. At what point do, uh, if, I've, if my system's been breached, at what point do I become a victim? And then all of a sudden you have the whole legal realm that you have to deal with uh, and the, the restrictions on being able to share information when there's a victim and a crime that occurs. Uh, those are some of the complexities with the communications document. I think we've got a great draft document in place. I expect it to come out, uh, I'm hoping fairly soon. The GCC has had a first look at it. The DHS has, has looked at it. And uh, I think the, the document will be yeah, very, uh, it has to be somewhat general, but it has a su sufficient specificity uh, without forcing because it can't be an enforcement document. But I think uh, state and local election officials, as well as DHS and EAC, will find it to be helpful. And this information has to flow back and forth, up and down, right? Exactly, and sometimes across state to state yeah. or across counties. Yeah. Okay. No, you talked about uh, not having enough resources. Um, what can local officials do now, even without having adequate resources? Sure. And I. I, I I mean, I'm not complaining about Cook County's resources. Certainly, the 
a play we could have made was to say, hey, funnel all that money down by account of registered voters, and Lance and I would take nearly half of Illinois' money. But th what the ecosystem right now needs is um, a more equalized or distributed model. You know, in Illinois, each of us have a voting system. Each of us have websites that we put results on. Each of us have our own registration system. Many of us have poll book systems. Each of us rely, we've got a similar suite of software that have similar vulnerabilities that we've got to protect, regardless of whether we've got 1.5 million voters or 10,000. Um, and so because of that, uh, I think we're settling in on the, the idea that the, the, the better play is to make sure those resources, those human resources, are getting into to each office. And the, the play, or the path forward, I think is, is pretty clear. I mean, the Center for Internet Security took a very good look at, uh, at our ecosystem and, and laid out some great recommendations for how to secure it. That's not an easy lift, though. Right? That takes a lot of time to digest. Um, you know, even in, in our offices with our <coughs> big staffs, we decided we needed to hire somebody who could just own this process for us, that we couldn't farm it out to somebody else. So um, the human resource is really, a, really, really a critical one. Uh, but So my suggestion for the local election official, hopefully with the Digital Defender working in partnership, is to take the CIS or Belfer documents and bring their election uh, security, primarily the digital tools rely upon for um, <coughs> Uh, like the internet-based tools, the public-facing websites, results, that's the most likely attack vector, um, bring it from its current state of security uh, to its future state as quickly as possible. So you all run pretty robust uh, election offices, but we have a lot of election offices with one person in them. Uh, yeah. if, if you could give them one or two piece of, pieces of advice on how to secure their offices, I'll just go down the line. What, what would that be? Uh, have an election, have a security mindset. You have to, election officials, we're already a little bit paranoid. I mean, we have backup plans for our backup plans. For the most OCD people I've ever met, by the way. <laughs> That's right. That's fair. Amen. Um, We've got to have a secure mindset, and we can't think that it just relates to the voting machines uh, or to the voter registration duties. It relates to our websites, our Facebook accounts, uh, our personal Facebook accounts. It relates uh, to our, our email and the security that we have around that, because that's quite often where the bad guys look first, because that tends to be where we're the most lax. So I'd say you start with a security mindset and you, you distribute that all the way down to the poll workers like you asked about earlier, Chair Hicks. What can they do? My thought is they, they have a security mindset. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I would say the human firewall training. You've heard that term before. Um, and uh, what, what the statistics I, I read or cited are somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all attacks uh, initiate through an email. So if you can address that uh, attack vector, uh, to borrow a NOAA term there, then, you know, you're making some progress there. And particularly if you only have an organization with a couple of email addresses, that's theoretically pretty fairly uh, easy to do. And then go, there, there's a lot of resources out there, even for small jurisdictions. I know, you, you know, you, you've got uh, other things that you're tending to, but there are, you know, carve out some time to, to, to look at the Belfer documents than the uh, CIS documents, and, and I know it's a, it's a lot to, uh, uh, we're, we're still on very much in the early stages of, uh, of looking at those and internalizing them and, and uh, implementing a lot of those recommendations, but there, there are tools out there, it's just a matter of having the time and, and, and the capacity to go, go find them. Lance? Yes, and there are a lot of st state organizations that are out there that are reaching out to the very local, the smallest local jurisdictions and giving as much help as possible. I know the State Board of Election has met with their security people and trying to get the word out to everybody. So it's something that we are, are actually having meetings constantly when we have state organization even uh, to meet and discuss this information. I know Noah spoke at a bunch of them, sent out an email blast to every election jurisdiction in, in Illinois. 
explaining what's going on and what we need to look out for. And as long as we keep getting that word out, I think they'll catch on. Yeah, I mean, when I was at DOJ, we always kind of put on our bad guy hats and thought, you know, if I was a bad guy, where would I, you know, how would I pull off what I wanted to pull off? And I, if we kind of do that ourselves in the local offices, I think, Ricky, you mentioned that, you know, figure out where the weak, weak links are in your system and, and start there. So thank you all. Keep hitting the button until it turns red. So I uh, want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we're going to take about a three-minute break while the staff puts the next panel together, and I can go get an allergy pill, um, and hopefully stop coughing. So, um, But I, again, want to thank you all for being here. Um, I look forward to working with all of you. Um, there was a lot of great things mentioned today. Um, I'm going to check with our general counsel and see what I can link to on our pay, on on my personal uh, commissioner page. Um, so if there's any information that you want to provide to the, the EAC <coughs> or voters in general that we can link to, I think that would be great. Uh, one of the great things about the EAC is our clearinghouse function, and so um, we hope to be able to provide that for voters in 2018 and 2020 moving forward. Thank you. Again, we're going to take a two-minute break and then um, start up with the second panel of um, state election officials.
only three? Who's? Welcome back, and thank you to our uh, state officials who are now joining us. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention that um, if you want to provide us a statement, um, we, and we've already got one from uh, Doug Kellner from New York, uh, but if you would like to provide a statement, and we urge you to do so, we'd love to hear from you, uh, please send it to us at clearinghouse at eac.gov. That's clearinghouse at eac.gov. So um, thank you. Thank you in advance for those statements. Uh, we'll read them all very carefully and uh, post them, I believe. So uh, I'd like to introduce our state panel. Uh, I'll just introduce all of you, and then we can go through the five-minute uh, run-through with a few questions afterwards. Uh, on my left is Brad King. Uh, Brad is the co-director of the Bipartisan Indiana Election Division. Uh, Brad, um, the Bipartisan Indiana Election Division provides information regarding the election process, campaign finance, voter registration, absentee voting, and for performing other duties in state election administration. Brad has served as a s senior staff attorney for the Legislative Services Agency and counsel to the Indiana House and Senate Elections Committees. He has also served as Assistant Corporation Counsel for the City of Indianapolis, Counsel to the Marion County Board of Voter Registration, and State Elections Director for the Secretary of State of Minnesota. So you've got a couple states there. Mm -hmm. And I know you went to William & Mary, so I know you've gotten along. Thank you. Brad, I look forward to your remarks. Next to Brad is uh, Elaine Manlove, uh, State Election Commissioner for the State of Delaware. Small wonder. I think you've got a number first of state. first state, a number of uh, nicknames for the state of Delaware. Elaine has been an election commissioner for the state of Delaware since 2007. Prior to that, she spent eight years as the director of the Department of Elections for Newcastle County. Throughout her vast experience, she has seen many changes from both the local and state election process. She has overseen Delaware's electronic signature project to allow voters to have their registration information transmitted in real time from the Division of Motor Vehicles to the Departments of Election in each county. As commissioner, she's responsible for the Help America Vote Act funds, the statewide voter registration system, campaign finance, and the parent student mock election. I look forward to hearing Elaine's remarks about Delaware's security efforts. Welcome, Elaine. And finally, we have uh, Peggy Reeves, assistant to the Secretary of State for Elections in my home state of Connecticut. Uh, Peggy was appointed Director of Elections for the Connecticut Secretary of the State's Office in 2011. Prior to joining the Secretary of State's Office, she served in Connecticut General Assembly as a state representative, representing the towns of Wilton and Norwalk, where she was a member of the Judiciary, Transportation, and Government Administration and Election Committees. Peggy was also a local election administrator for 14 years in the town of Wilton. And with that, let's start on the other side. I'll turn it over to Peggy. Is that it? Sorry. OK. Um, thank you for inviting us to be part of this conversation on election security. And before I begin my remarks, I'm going to take a minute of my time to thank you for all that you do, Commissioner Hicks. Commissioner McCormick, former Chair and Commissioner Matt Masterson, and Director Newby. You're always there for us to attend our local and state conferences. You have attended and presented at every meeting of the National Association of State Election Directors. We've used your quick start guides, your checklists, your guidelines, your fact sheets. In short, I don't know what we would do without all of you. So to whoever is listening, <laughs> we want you all to stick around, and it is our hope that at least one and possibly two additional EAC commissioners will be appointed soon. So last fall, we were surprised to learn that Connecticut was one of 21 states that was targeted by the Russian government. But fortunately, we have a strong network of protection on the state level as we have been a member of MSI SAC for many years and we are also protected with an Albert monitor. Our cybersecurity defenses held 
and the Russians were turned away. But it was a wake-up call for us. So we are now leveraging the services provided to us by DHS, MSISAC, EIISAC, and as well as other agencies to further protect our infrastructure. We're doing real-time monitoring of all inbound and outbound traffic to our state network, weekly hygiene scans of internet-facing applications, and a risk and vulnerability assessment from DHS, which is scheduled for next week. As an additional level of security, our centralized voter registration system is not directly connected to the internet. In order to access the system, the local election official must use a workstation that has connectivity to the state network. All 169 towns in Connecticut have a state provided connection to allow for access to the voter registration database. But Connecticut, like all of New England, is highly decentralized. We do not have county government. So elections are run by 338 registrars of voters, 169 town clerks, for a total of 507 local election officials who oversee our elections and must be trained by our office. And if you add in the deputies and the assistants who work in the local town offices, we are talking about several thousand local officials. In many respects, this de decentralization is a strength because it would be extremely difficult to hack an election. But that decentralization is also a weakness because of possible vulnerabilities in the many access points into the centralized voter registration system. For example, are they using operating systems that are no longer supported like Windows XP? Are we being told if ransomware um, is being uh, put on their local machines? Certainly the State Fusion Center would um, be informed of it, but we not, might not be informed at the state level. So over the next two months, we have decided to do enhancements to the voter registration database that will be implemented to enhance user authentication, including a stronger password policy and two-factor authentication. Also, we will have a new analytics report that will compare voter data over time to look for any anomalies, sort of untoward events that we're not expecting. Um, in addition, we have seen an increasing need over the last decade for a marriage between IT and elections. Because we have found that you have IT personnel who don't understand elections, and you have election staff who don't understand IT. So now more than ever, we need to merge those two. Therefore, um, we have asked to create a cybersecurity election system within our office consisting of an election officer with subject matter experience in technology and cybersecurity and an IT cybersecurity professional who would have subject matter ex experience in elections. We have also recently created a Connecticut cybersecurity task force com composed of representatives from DHS, the Connecticut National Guard, um, state government, legislative and municipal leadership, academics, and local election officials to share best practices for election security and to solicit their, solicit their advice on the expenditure of new HAVA funds. We are pleased that Congress authorized these additional HAVA funds to enhance technology and make election security improvements. We believe the 2018 election will be one of the most challenging elections we have faced, but we will work with our local election officials to make sure that our systems are secure and the public has confidence in the outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank you. Miss Elaine. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. And I want to echo what Peggy said about thank you for just being there for all of us. The EAC has become such a go-to place for all of us that it, it, it makes a big difference in the way we do our business. It gives us a central place to go to for answers. Um, so the first round of HAVA allowed Delaware to introduce electronic signature, the interface that we've faced with, that we've made with uh, DMV, the real-time interface. Uh, it also allowed us to do uh, automatic voter registration, which was kind of the, I guess our e-signature was the forerunner to automatic voter registration. Then online voter registration. So we used most of the original HAVA funds to use technology to improve the way we did the way we do our business every day. Um, as we move forward with the new funding, as grateful as we are for this funding, you know, our plates are even fuller now than they were then because of security. 
So I just want to bring you up to speed with what Delaware is looking, looking at as we move forward. We need new voting machines. Um, when the first round of HAVA funds came out, our machines were fairly new, and I got lots of phone calls about what a great job Delaware did because we had electronic voting. We had no paper trail, but we had electronic voting, and people in Delaware were watching the TV, seeing everybody with the hanging chads, and calling me up saying what a great job Delaware was doing. And now those same people are calling saying, uh, where's the paper trail? So. Times change. Um, but as we look at new voting machines, security is, of course, a big part of that. Um, I, as I said, the public is concerned now about the paper trail where they weren't. They also don't understand that it's a process to buy new voting machines. Um, I think the general public sees, well, you don't have a paper trail, so let's just go buy new machines as if I could walk into Staples and load up a cart. Um, so the public, we used a lot of public input in this. We had a task force to review different types of voting systems. Um, but the big debate, again, is whether we use, there will be paper, whether we have paper as a, a voting on paper or whether we have a DRE with a VVPAT. There, that's the, the uh, challenge at this moment in time. Um, thanks to HAVA, I am sure that, thanks to the HAVA funds, I'm sure that will be a part of uh, get the funds that buy these new voting machines. Um, we're also looking at electronic poll books, something we don't have now. Uh, but there's a bill in our legislature now to create early voting, and that may that will necessitate the poll books. Um, the state, we are on the state's mainframe, and they want us to get off the state's mainframe, so we're looking now at election management and voter registration system. And we will look at updating our absentee system, although the one we have is, uh, we've we bought with HAVA funds and it is fine. Um, so we are different than uh, a lot of other states. Delaware's, everybody, all the election officials in Delaware are state employees, always have been. We used to have four different agencies, but a few years ago they were merged into one State Department of Elections. So it, it makes us different. We don't have, while we have county offices, they're not really locals, they are state, state employees. Um, so we work together. We meet once a month and review all of the security protocols. Uh, we meet with our Department of Technology. Uh, Delaware was one of the 21 states where there was an attempted intrusion. Um, I thank our Department of uh, Technology and Information for providing the security. So we work with them, and this new time frame has allowed me to find out that we have always belonged to MSISAC as far as Department of Technology, not necessarily elections. Um, we do have an Albert monitor. I went back from the last meeting I was at and said, oh my God, we need to get this Albert monitor. I found out, well, we have two. So um, I am confident in the security we have, but every day is a new turn in the, in the book here to find a new page of what else has gone on that we don't know. Um, as we move forward, we're looking at the penetration testing through Homeland Security, and I found out, and this is something I have a question for everybody here. Um, um, using DHS versus an outside vendor. Uh, apparently, DS, uh, Homeland Security does not alter their rules of engagement, and Delaware Department of Technology and Information, not me, would want them to specify exactly what areas they're going into. And I think, in reality, that works, but in, in, in the view of Department of Technology and Information, they want all that addressed in writing. So we're back and forth on that right now. And I'd like to talk to other states during the next couple of days and see what, what their experience have, has been. So again, we are grateful for the additional funding. But again, our plates are even more full than, we, than they were now because of security. So this is a great help to us. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Brad, I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Hicks, Vice Chair McCormick. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. I'll say it's unanimous. Uh, the United States Election Assistance Commission has lived up to its name, particularly with regard to voting systems. I don't know what Indiana counties and Indiana voters would have been able to do or accomplish during the time that the EAC has been in operation uh, in improving the quality and confidence in our voting systems without your help. So thank you for that. Thank you. 
I was also intrigued during the opening remarks made by commission members that you both mentioned uh, territories and the Pacific Ocean. The smallest U.S. possession is a beautiful tropical island in the South Pacific noted for its scuba diving named Kingman Reef. Unfortunately, it has no population, so therefore it will not qualify for any grants. <laughs> but I think that a voter or even election administrator certainly would have had to have spent the last two years scuba diving off of Kingman Reef to not have their concern and awareness regarding cybersecurity uh, brought to the fore. I want to take uh, my remarks to focus on one aspect of security um, that I think is particularly important for county and local election officials. Uh, in Indiana, we've certainly taken the challenges and threats of cybersecurity to our statewide voter registration system very seriously. Our legislature appropriated funds for a modernization of our voting system or voter registration system uh, to incorporate new security features as they became available. But we noted that there were physical security protocols that we could undertake, uh, and the counties in our case, who maintain voting systems can undertake, that will increase public confidence. Because it's not a question simply of the statewide VR systems, but also of the voter vote, voting systems that are maintained locally. And so as part of the short legislative session this year, Indiana adopted Public Law 100. Public Law 100 focuses on the physical security of voting systems primarily at the county level. It provides for counties to be reimbursed for taking relatively simple and inexpensive steps to develop security protocols uh, ranging from items as relatively inexpensive as alarm systems, video cams, uh, that the state will provide money for as reimbursement. The legislation also sets forth very detailed protocols regarding uh, chain of custody, sealing, and other items with regard to the physical management of voting systems, but recognizes that not all counties are the same. As other speakers have indicated, some have large staffs. They also have large numbers of voting systems or electronic poll books. Uh, other counties have one person or two persons required for that task. And so Public Law 100 provides for those counties to work with our voting system technical oversight program uh, based out of Ball State University uh, and with the election division to develop customized security protocols for that county to implement. We've also in the legislation provided for various aspects of beefing up the comprehensive inventory we have of individual voting system units and electronic poll books throughout the state by identifying the specific locations where those are stored and secured, uh, and also requiring that counties certify annually that the information that's contained in that inventory is up to date. With that in mind, we've addressed the end of life process for voting systems and electronic poll books. When a county disposes of either of those items, it is now required under Public Law 100 to submit a voting system or electronic poll book disposal plan to the state for review and approval. Uh, we look forward to making certain that the inventory remains constantly current and further addressed an issue that arose <clears throat> with regard to the distribution of voting systems at the beginning of life. We had an individual who approached a small voting system vendor in Indianapolis uh, before a highly publicized uh, national convention uh, requesting to buy a voting system. The individual did not follow through with their purchase, but it prompted the legislature to include a provision in this bill that bans the sale or transfer of Indiana certified voting systems within Indiana except to the limited case of counties in Indiana who will use them or other counties or jurisdictions throughout the United States. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I'll start, start sure, I'll start with questions. And you mentioned just now vendors uh, and 
mentioned uh, experience you had with a vendor. In general, how have the vendors been? I mean, this is an important, they're an important partner in the election community. Uh, we don't often hear from them in this kind of a setting, but what have your experiences been with them? Are they, can they help bridge some of the issues here uh, between states and locals? Yes, Commissioner, I think that's true beyond question. The, the vendors play a key pivotal role in the security process for the voting systems. I would say our experience has been mixed, uh, particularly with regard to electronic poll book vendors, which is a, a growing industry. Um, the education process regarding cybersecurity threats and physical security threats is not just happening for election officials, it's happening for vendors. And we've noticed a growth curve and, and overall a desire to cooperate and help us improve the system. So do you think they're taking adequate steps to address the cybersecurity and the security, physical security issues? I am not confident that all vendors are fully addressing all cybersecurity concerns. Some of that may be a question of timing and process uh, and the role of the marketplace. Thank you. You have either or the other want to weigh in on that vendor issue? Well, I've been dealing with vendors recently and uh, I've been satisfied with the response. Again, when we talk about adequate as far as security, I'm, I never know what adequate is. I think we think we're all at some level, but if the bad guys get to another level, I think that's just an ongoing game that we're going to be playing. And I think, you know, we thought Florida 2000 was a game changer for us. I don't think we've ever seen a game changer like this. And, and I think it's the new way of life for all of us. So yes, I do think the vendors are working with us, but I think we're all in the same game. So I would just add that I think our vendors in the past have been focused on the um, physical security of things. So that strict chain of custody of the voting machine and programming the memory cards and everything for our optical stand tabulators but not so much on cybersecurity. So I think that's something we all need to talk about and, and perhaps have audits of the vendors themselves, um, you know, where they program the cards to be sure that that is safe and secure. Do any of your states do audits? And if you do, you know, what do, what do those look like? We do random audits in Delaware. It's not mandated in the code, but I expect that it will be going forward. So we are mandated to do 5% of all the polling places um, on a random basis after every election and primary. We have a provision for audits upon request following the election. Okay. Um, Peggy, you mentioned the Albert sensor. Yes. Uh, this is one of those questions where we know the answers, but not everybody does. Can you tell us what an Albert sensor well, is? I knew you would ask that question, so <laughs> I did write it down a little bit, because I honestly <clears throat> didn't know before now. So I think it's also called Einstein sometimes, right? But it's, the, um, it's a network monitoring system which provides automated alerts of malicious network threats focused on state, local, territorial, and tribal. And it's sent, so if anything comes up, it's sent to MSISEC for analysis and then they let us know. I think basically that's what I've been told it is, so. Thank you. <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> what, uh, um, what do you, would you consider your biggest one or two challenges or risks in this security environment? Uh, each of you, maybe just one or two things that you're most concerned about. Well, again, I think I've always already spoken about our local election officials are terrific, but many of them just work on a part-time basis. They may come in once a week. You know, they don't necessarily, because they're such tiny towns in Connecticut, they are not staffed every day. Um, the town clerks are there, to, and, but the town clerks are only involved in issuing absentee ballots in terms of elections, so everything else is done by the registrars of voters. And so my concern is the fact that we have very part-time people and we have to make sure that they are, are certainly um, trained on cybersecurity going forward. So maybe some professionalism issues? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Elaine? And I think it, while we are all one, we're all state employees, but I do think making everyone understand from no matter what position you have that cybersecurity affects all of us and making everyone aware of the importance of it and, and yes, training, training and training. training. Yeah. 
In addition, I would add my concern is with regard to the chain of communication. Uh, so often we discover an issue, whether it's uh, one of real concern or simply a one of perception, uh, only after it's become a public issue or public question. Uh, we encourage certainly the vendors and our county election officials uh, to inform us immediately of any anomaly so that we can promptly investigate it and prevent any concern that's unfounded. And I think that carries forward with regard to Elaine's point on training. Uh, we need to empower the poll workers to ask questions, to say, I'm seeing something unusual. Um, it may mean nothing, but I'm making you, in this case the county or the state, aware of the problem so that if there is further action needed, it can be taken promptly. So I'll just say one more thing. I mean, recognizing that incidents uh, can happen and probably will, can our voters have confidence in the security of our elections? Yes, I would say yes, they, sh yeah. they should. I mean, for example, we can state emphatically that no votes were changed in the 2016 election. Um, and I think they should have um, faith in the fact that we are moving forward to make sure that we do the best we can um, to make sure that nothing happens to jeopardize the 2018 and 2020. Yeah, I agree with Peggy. And 2016 was a wake-up call for all of us. We didn't know what we didn't know. And now we are, have kind of marshaled all the forces available to us to mitigate anything like this. So I think, yes, I have confidence. I have more knowledge than I did before. And yes, more confidence goes with that. Yes, I'll join that statement to say that I certainly have full confidence that the elections that we conduct throughout the United States are as secure as we can make them at this point. There is always room for improvement. There will always be new technological challenges, but our presence here today is an indication of our dedication to meet them. Thank you to all of you. Um, that's a question I'm asked often when I'm out. When people ask me, can we really believe in, you know, the results of our elections. So I think it's good for us to remind voters that we do and can have confidence in our elections. Mm -hmm. Yep. Chairman Hicks. I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I've known each of you for a number of years, and I know that the voters should have explicit confidence that their elections are being run well by the work that you do in your states. Um, Mr. King, you've mentioned um, audits can be um, triggered by request. Who makes that request? Uh, the request in the, in, <clears throat> under Indiana statutes can be made by uh, political party chairs who might anticipate a recount being filed. Just want to make sure that it's not in, individuals just saying, I don't believe this happened. I want you to do a audit sort of thing. So it has to be one of the political parties. That's correct. It's essentially limited to the individuals who would be entitled to a petition for a recount or contest. Mm -hmm. Ms. Manlove, you had mentioned that the state is asking that um, you leave their mainframe. Um, what sort of, do you have an estimate of time frame and, and cost that's going to be associated with that? Not yet. I mean, we're working on that right now, and it all, you know, I now have an RFP that's, we have responses to the RFP, and part of that is the new election management system. It all, when we get down to the dollars and cents of it, where we're, we're not there yet, um, it will happen sooner than later, but that's all going to depend on the cost of the voting machine. Our RFP was four sections, voting machines, uh, election management system, absentee, and poll books. So depending on the cost is depending on how fast it all happens. My goal is it all happens at the same time. And do, um, so, so I guess it's more for all three of you, is, um, are you on the mainframe for your particular states or do you have an individual mainframe for your offices? We have a dedicated mainframe. And again, we are on the state's mainframe but working to move off. And we have a server, but it's all within all of the state service. And in fact, um, it's in the same uh, area as our state police, so we feel that it's pretty well protected. And I only have a couple more questions, because uh, I believe that there are other events going on today. And uh, we have a third panel um, going on uh, in, in a bit. But um, 
what, and I want to thank you for the praise that you gave to the EAC, and it's, you know, it's, as chair, it's easy to sit here and try to take credit for that, but it's mostly the staff that uh, we have a very dedicated staff, and I'm very proud of each and every one of the individuals who've come through that door and uh, the work that they do for the EAC. Um, so I think that they should be the ones that are um, bathed in this, the, the accolades that you, that you bestowed upon us. Um, but that being said, what more can we do to help you um, in 2018 and 2020? Um, I believe, you know, with the, with the Congress coming together, which no one saw and anticipated of giving $380 million uh, moving forward, um, other than additional resources in terms of funding, what else can the EAC do to, to help you with your elections? I would say just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I took a look at your website and there is such a wealth of information there, almost too much. I mean, you could spend days looking at everything that you have. And I think the more that we can um, get the word out to local officials to use your website, um, because it's terrific. So I would just say keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'll echo that. It is a great place. You know, we have a place now to go that we didn't have before when we need information. Or we have somebody to pick up a phone and call and say, I need help with something. That's a great asset for all of us. In addition to those, I would add, uh, continue the efficient manner in which you've begun the process of educating us about the new funding. Uh, work with us as we have questions. Um, and I anticipate that uh, we'll be able to use that money in the best interest of the voter. Thank you. Do you have any additional questions? So I want to thank you all for, for being a part of this. Um, I've been invited to two of your states, and I hope to come and uh, it's, I guess, every Monday, the first Monday of each month, and then it's going to be in September, hopefully, uh, that the uh, Clerks Association is going to have me in Connecticut. So oh, awesome. um, I want to thank you all for being here, um, and thank you for what you do, and um, see, look forward to seeing you tomorrow and, uh, with the Standards Board. Uh, with that, I wanted to open it up for the audience. If you are an election administrator or election um, person. Um, Natalie from our staff is there and you can line up behind her. Um, we're going to set the timer for five minutes each. Um, so if you want to step to the podium, I ask that you uh, give your name, your uh, affiliation with the uh, state that you're with and um, limit your comments to five minutes. And we'll try to get as many, if you want to use a podium or if you want to sit at the, the seat. Yeah, we want to limit it as much as possible. Um, so they want you to oh, use oh, the here. podium. So, yep. So if you can turn the other two mics off, I think that's, if you turn the other two off, that one should come on. There you go. It's, yep. When it turns red. Yep. There you go. Thank you. I can program a voting system. I cannot operate a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Dwight Shellman, and I'm the County Regulation and Support Manager for the Elections Division of the Colorado Secretary of State's Office. Um, thank you very much, Commissioners and Chairman, for hosting this forum. It's an important dialogue to have. Um, I did want to just make a, a kind of a couple of pleas uh, to various constituencies that I think are important in this process. Um, Commissioner Hicks asked uh, at the conclusion, what more can the EAC do? And I think there's an important area of substantive leadership here for the EAC. Um, every state and local election official in the country is confronting uh, similar threats in different models, in you know, different circumstances in their own individual jurisdictions, but the threats are common. And rather than having 50 states and territories and you know, 6,000 local election jurisdictions uh, recreate the wheel on all of these elements, I think there is some commonality that the EAC can provide some resources for. For example, 
an online cybersecurity training for state and local election officials and poll workers. And I think as Noah pointed out, this is, we are all as strong as our weakest links. And because of that, you know, such an online course, if it could be tested and a certificate issued, um, that might help us all, you know, we could send our locals to, to that resource to accomplish that particular objective. Um, and I'm sure there are many other ideas out there. Um, my next plea is to the um, election integrity advocates. Uh, I think it's very important here to remember that technology enables state and local election officials to make voting as easy as possible for voters. And that is a very important value to election officials. Um, and technology, however, always introduces additional vulnerabilities. So I would just encourage um, uh, the, the advocates to understand that we really need to, to do this with a trust but verify approach. It's okay to use technology, but the technology must be used wisely and knowing its vulnerabilities and making sure we mitigate those vulnerabilities. And I raise that because so much of the dialogue here I think is counterproductive. Messaging matters. And the Russians aren't going to have to hack a single thing if the messaging results in our citizenry just concluding that it's hopeless and we're all vulnerable. That is absolutely not the case. Um, and then my final plea is a plea to the system providers, both voting systems and the dependent election systems. Um, hopefully they understand, and I think most of them do, that they are now providers of critical infrastructure and trust but verify applies to them as well. They are very important partners in delivering uh, election services and um, I know many of us really hope that they will collaborate with us uh, on those efforts, and we really need that from them. Finally, I just wanted to mention that immediately after this forum, the Brennan Center for Justice is hosting a panel uh, in the Cadiz room on the mezzanine level, uh, which will just be a panel discussion where we can get in the room and maybe talk through some of these issues. Uh, Trey Grayson, the former Secretary of State for Kentucky, will be moderating that. Uh, Doug Kellner of New York and Liz Howard, formerly of Virginia, will be on the panel, as I will be as well. And it's just an opportunity for us to get in a room together and start brainstorming about maybe the best way to approach this issue and uh, strategies to prioritize our various needs. That's going to be here in the hotel? Yes. It, it'll be starting at 4.15, and it's just up on the next level in the Cadiz room. And refreshments will be served. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Kellner. I'm a co-chair of the New York State Board of Elections. And I'll uh, join uh, Dwight's invitation to, uh, for those of you who'd like to join us in the Cadiz room, one flight up, uh, to uh, continue these discussions. Uh, I have uh, submitted a lengthy uh, statement, um, uh, which I hope uh, will get published eventually. Uh, and so I'll just uh, focus on uh, two or three small points uh, that uh, I think uh, have not been discussed so far. Um, uh, that uh, Governor Cuomo in New York has been very proactive in recognizing the security threats. He made this a priority in his uh, State of the State address and also in um, the most recently enacted budget. And, um, one of the uh, innovative things that uh, was added uh, to New York law um, was to uh, require disclosure of independent expenditures for internet ads. 
And I understand that uh, uh, Seattle, Washington has had uh, that requirement for many years, but I think New York is the first state to actually implement it. And it'll be uh, very interesting to see uh, how those disclosure requirements uh, uh, actually affect spending and the fact that we're required to put up all of these things on our own website uh, leads me to wonder what will happen. Will the State Board of Elections, in effect, become a clearinghouse for uh, political advertising in New York um, as a consequence of that requirement that we actually post all of the uh, ads? Um, a second thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is that um, uh, many of us have been advocating on the need for a voter verifiable paper audit trail for many years, and uh, many states have that voter verifiable paper audit trail. The audit trail is only useful if, in fact, there are audits, so audits are a very important aspect. There are many different ways to conduct audits, uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting issues that uh, has been arising recently is that there are about half a dozen states that um, have scanning systems that record ballot images and where those states allow those ballot images to be um, accessed by the public. And I think that that's a very important uh, area. Um, we just uh, had a court decision in New York uh, which will allow New Yorkers to obtain uh, copies of ballot images uh, by the Freedom of Information Law. And what that does is it gives uh, the voters the right, in effect, to do their own audit. Uh, because uh, they can go and uh, take those images and do their audits. And in the long run, that increases the confidence in the uh, system. Um, uh, many citizens have access ballot images uh, in the various states where it's been allowed and have done those audits, and those audits confirm the outcomes of the elections. Uh, and uh, uh, having that kind of transparency and verifiability is one important way to increase confidence in the elections. And by having that audit capability, that, of course, makes it that much more difficult to hack and uh, challenge the outcome of an election. So thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Hicks, Vice Chairwoman McCormick. Uh, my name is Rob Rock, Director of Elections for Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea in the state of Rhode Island, uh, and I first want to thank you for hosting this meeting. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about uh, quickly, I think I'm last, so I'll be brief, but much of what I, I'm going to talk about is what Rhode Island's doing to secure elections in the state, and much of it we have learned at these type of meetings from other states, so it's been very helpful for us, and hopefully we can be helpful for, um, for others. Uh, when Secretary Gorbea got elected in, 2015, or in 2014 and started in 2015, one of her top goals was to modernize elections in Rhode Island, and one way that we're doing that uh, is on the cybersecurity front. Uh, just last Wednesday, uh, we held a briefing for members of the public and for the media regarding what Rhode Island's doing to ensure that our elections are as secure as possible, and we came out with a report, which I'm going to reference briefly, and I will also send to the EAC uh, for reference. Um, but essentially, the report outlines the work that Rhode Island's done uh, over the last three years in three specific uh, categories. One is online systems, the other election day operations, and the other is uh, human resources. And, and I want to make it clear that it's been a collaborative effort in Rhode Island. Uh, Secretary Gorbea feels it's very important that we have as many people at the table as possible. And so a lot of the stuff that we've done have come uh, with the help of the General Assembly, the Governor's Office, the Board of Elections, our local election officials, which I'd like to take a moment to recognize. Louise Fanoff, who's our local election official here today at the Standards Board. Uh, it's her first meeting, so welcome, Louise. Uh, but quickly, I want to talk about how we're securing our online systems. The Secretary of State has taken uh, a variety of measures to greatly reduce and mitigate the threat of cyber attacks. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is, like many states, partnering with the Department of Homeland Security. 
uh, under the criti critical infrastructure designation to further protect our central voter registration system uh, by testing for vulnerabilities, sharing cybersecurity information, threat incident reporting, and receiving ongoing risk and vulnerability assessments that include penetration testing, web application testing, and social uh, engineering. We're also working with our state's higher education institutions. We're very fortunate in Rhode Island to have uh, quite a few nationally recognized uh, institutes of higher learning. Uh, for example, Brown University and Salve Regina University, we worked with closely on cybersecurity and computer science matters, and they've been great. Uh, having academics at the table has been really helpful uh, for us. And we're also working with other state partners, such as the National Guard and the State Police's Fusion Center, who have both uh, done assessments on our voting systems and offered recommendations uh, for ways that we can be, uh, we can protect ourselves even more. So they've been, it's been great to partner with other state entities because, again, having, having as many people at the table as possible, we feel is very important. Uh, election Day obviously is very important, and, and in 2016, we procured new voting equipment with the ultimate uh, security measure in that we have paper ballots. We've had paper ballots since uh, 1998, and we'll continue to have paper ballots, so we're fortunate uh, there. We're also, uh, in 2016, uh, we rolled out uh, a pilot program for e-poll books, and in 2018, we're going to roll it out for the entire state, and our electronic poll books utilize a proprietary encrypted application running on Apple's ISO software, which meets the security requirements for the federal government's secure networks, such as the Department of Defense and Department of uh, Justice's data applications. We also passed, in 2017, an audit law. Uh, which is very similar to what Dwight Shellman and his team in Colorado successfully uh, launched last year. Uh, we have a risk-limiting audit law that we're going to be rolling out over the next few election cycles, uh, which we feel is, is very important. And then finally, uh, securing our human resources. Uh, we've worked quite uh, intently to bring, make sure that all election officials at the state and local level uh, have the knowledge uh, to prevent threats and assess problems. Uh, local municipalities have a variety of technological expertise, and it's imperative that local election officials can speak articulately about se election security and help prevent uh, attacks on our systems. And so in 2017, in October, we convened the, uh, all the cities and towns for a cybersecurity summit, which we went over uh, cybersecurity uh, protections, things about making sure passwords are safe and make sure that you don't click on emails and attachments from people you don't know and things of that sort. But it's very important that we uh, train our state and local election officials on that stuff, state included as well. Uh, we're going to continue to do those cybersecurity summits. We also, uh, within the Department of State, uh, began a phishing campaign to test and educate all of our staff, not just elections, but the entire Department of State staff, uh, to be sure that uh, we know how to handle emails and, and passwords and things of that sort. It's very important. And we're also going to be uh, involved in the Secure the Human program, where all of our employees are going to be uh, trained uh, on the best practices for cybersecurity. So I'll end. Uh, with, you know, federal, state, and local government cannot allow uh, cyber threats to election systems, whether real or perceived, uh, to undermine the role of voting plays in our society. Uh, despite the progress made over the last three years, I'm almost done, uh, it is important to remember that cybersecurity is not a destination, but a continually evolving road that requires constant attention to mitigate risk. We must always strive to do better for voters because the single act of casting a ballot is fundamental to our democracy and fundamental to making government accountable to the people it serves. This will require a continued commitment and the corresponding dedicated, dedication of resources to ensure the integrity of our voting systems. And I apologize for going over my allotted time. Being last, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, just while I was sitting here, uh, just an observation, you know, 18 years ago, this was ground zero, South Florida in the uh, Bush v. Gore race. And, uh, how far this community, this election field has come since then. It is remarkable. Uh, and I appreciate all the professionalism in this room, uh, the excellent comments and uh, questions that we've received today. And uh, I just want to thank you all who are in the election uh, field for your hard work and your continued dedication as public servants to our representative democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McCormick. Um, I want to echo that, but also add that those folks born during that 2000 election are now going to be eligible to vote. So um, keep that in mind as we move forward with 2018. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us here today in Miami and online. Um, all of the statements delivered today will become part of the EAC's official record and available on our website. 
For those watching, statements can be emailed to listen at eac.gov and for, or, or clearinghouse. oh, yeah, or clearinghouse. Clearinghouse at eac.gov. Uh, for more information about the EAC and our work on this and other topics, please visit eac.gov. With that, uh, we will close this forum and move forward with the rest of the um, Standards Board and Board of Advisors.